Thank you again. Right, <coughs> let's uh, proceed uh, with the rest. Uh, money, I thought I'll hold the money matters until after the break. Um, this is what was I saw on the web today, 200 quarter of a billion pounds. Do not pay that amount if you're buying one. <laughs> Hammer it down to at least 200 million. It's not worth more than that. This is uh, Airbus trying to make uh, money because of the sheer demand. Also, the engines uh, cost uh, just under 10 million pounds. Uh, according to our calculations, not airlines calculations, uh, you need to fill about 58% of the seats to make a profit on a particular flight. And this is a very, very pessimistic prediction with a typical load factor of 83%, that's 83% of the seats filled, you, uh, the airline should be making on that flight a profit of about £31,000 before taxes. However, the way some of the airlines operate, you can, I think, uh, double that figure. Uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, jobs are concerned, about 40,000 jobs have been created, uh, 400 companies involved, and uh, there's more to come. Now, as far as the uh, fuel consumption is concerned, what I have done is I have done all the calculations so that you can equate the whole thing to that of a car. Now, I'm not going to pack the entire aircraft with uh, economy class passengers. I'm going to be sensible and uh, make it comfortable. So it's fully complemented, but comfortably complemented, uh, the, um, production, uh, the um, fuel consumption figures are, first of all, ocean-going airliners, they are very, very bad. You only get a maximum. These are the very latest technology airline, ocean going liners. It's about 11 uh, miles per gallon. Petrol range rover, just for comparison, gives about 17. This is the actual return from the in service A380 value. It's about, you're getting about 25 miles per gallon. <coughs> Commuter buses don't go a long way, they don't carry a hell of a lot of fuel, but they get about 56. I got friends who drive hybrid cars and they claim that they can't get anywhere near the figure that's claimed by Toyota in their website. Then you have coaches and diesels at about uh, 88 miles per gallon. But uh, don't forget, in the case of trains, they're not too worried about the fuel consumption. Most of the money goes on track line and signal maintenance. So, uh, the aircraft has been introduced into service and uh, there were the usual problems. Um, quite a few failures, overheating problems, lack of heating problems, undercarriage problems, uh, uh, Pressurization problems, uh, cracks being found on this, that, and the other, the latest being the attachment of the ribs to the uh, wing skin and so on. And uh, they were overcome bit by bit and are still being overcome. But by far the most spectacular <coughs> was this one. This is a uh, <coughs> Qantas A380 that was uh, climbing out after taking off from uh, Heathrow. And uh, as it was climbing out, is this engine, the port in engine, number two engine, that uh, basically exploded. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the next two slides, I know it's, I'm being filmed. I hope I don't end up in jail, because, but I do have permission from Rolls-Royce to show this. If you look at the traces, um, these are the actual traces. Don't worry too much about uh, the labeling. But uh, what you're looking at is uh, what actually happened to all the pressure, temperature, at uh, various points in the, uh, uh, the engine. And uh, typically it starts at about 825 degrees Celsius for the exhaust gas temperature. And then it suddenly rose to about 940 Celsius in about four seconds. But what, was, um, what preceded this event is another temperature, which is the, uh, <coughs> the oil temperature, which uh, of, these are the temperature for all four engines, but engine number two, from 29 Celsius, it took long, it took about 49 seconds. Uh, it uh, shot up from 178 Celsius to 196 to Celsius, sorry, excuse me. And uh, from this, you can sort of roughly work backwards to find out the sequence of events leading to failure. So let's look at the uh, cross-section of a typical three-spool engine. <coughs> Uh, you have the big fan at the front being driven by this innermost shaft uh, by these turbines at the back end. And then you have the bits in red, which is the intermediate pressure spool. And then you have the one in black, which is the high pressure. So you've got the high pressure compressor, combustion chamber, and the high pressure turbine. So basically, it's 
suck in the air, squeeze, 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 all the way to 41 times the atmosphere, spray it with fuel, burn it, and the whole thing explodes and dries out uh, the back whilst uh, rotating the turbines. In here, you have the high-pressure turbine and the intermediate-pressure turbine discs. The plates are attached to a disc and the discs then slide out to supply and shaft. And you have a little uh, housing here which uh, basically supports the rotating structure. In there, you have uh, the lubrication pipe, uh, uh, lubrication oil delivery pipe uh, running at high pressure. One of those pipes had not been manufactured properly. And the end result was that the thickness of the wall was not constant. There was a thinning of the wall on one side. These things are designed to the absolute <coughs> maximum. And uh, if there is a weakness, the system will find it. And what had happened in this case is that a crack had developed. And uh, the end result was that uh, it uh, resulted in leakage of oil into this chamber. Don't you believe oil manufacturers saying that their lubrication oil will never catch fire because of uh, it filled with detergents and anti-fire agents, whatever? This thing did catch fire. And the end result is that the temperature in that region shot up to way above what it should be. And that resulted in the weakening of the alloys. Now, this particular, if you remember, that single stage intermediate pressure turbine is driving eight stages of compressors at the front end. The bits that failed was that the splines sheared circumferentially. And the end result was that that disc began to freewheel. It was no longer driving the compressor at the front end. You have all that energy and you now got an awful lot of load taken off it. And the end result is that that disc started accelerating to the point where it exceeded the critical burst speed. And as it disintegrated, ladies and gentlemen, there's so much energy, nothing in the world is going to stop the shrapnel from penetrating just about anything and everything under the sun. So what you're going to do is uh, look at the oil, it, uh, the oil pipe itself, and then I want to, there are quite a few things I don't understand, and we also have a look at the broken disc and uh, parts of the wing. So this is the actual oil pipe, and you can see there's uh, localized uh, thinning. It's, uh, the counter boring did not run through during manufacture, that's what actually happened. But what I don't understand is um, the Australian investigators are claiming that this shiny part of the fracture is the one that's due to fatigue. For me, this broken bit has got all the hallmarks of fatigue failure. This clean break normally indicates that the crack propagated at uh, supersonic speed inside the material, typically about 14 kilometers a second. Not the air, uh, uh, velocity but uh, temperature inside the velocity inside the material so that is something I don't understand anyway if you now look at the uh, the disc itself that part of the disc uh, weighs about as much as I do perhaps a bit lighter but the interesting thing is that if you measure that angle that's about 120 degrees now Rolls-Royce insist that these things always split one-third two-thirds theoretically there is no reason for this, so that needs a bit of investigation as well. And this was the final piece that has been discovered. So, <coughs> as the engine exploded, uh, the main shrapnel exited the back end of the engine, went through the wing, and the most, the strongest part of the wing is the front spar, it's an I-beam that runs from the root to the tip. Now, if you look at the the front part of the spar, this was uh, what was frightening, is that uh, you're now looking at the, uh, the wing section from the front. You can see it's, uh, it's that serration of the, uh, the bits where the, um, the blades used to be. It's gone straight through. Also, all these cables are very, very incredibly strong. It just slides through them like nobody's business. And if you look at the same photograph, this is this, the, uh, the main load-bearing member, the spa. If you look at it from the rear, <coughs> uh, you can see uh, the same pattern. And it's then gone, 
is that it has gone straight through the uh, upper skin. Fortunately, it uh, went, it cleared this fuselage. If by chance it had entered the cabin, God knows what it had done to the occupants. We were extremely lucky that day. God was on our side. And if you now look at the, the wing from the top end, so you are now looking down on the wing from the cabin, uh, that is the point at which this particular part of the disc uh, emanated. You also have other major bits and pieces. And basically that wing took two cannon shells and several rounds of large caliber machine gun bullets in an instant. And somehow survived. As far as I'm concerned, that aircraft is cleared for military service. <laughs> so, what happened next? Well, First of all, there were loads and loads of uh, alarms and uh, warning systems going off inside the flight deck. Lots and lots of leaks all over the place and uh, many, many problems. A lot of uh, wires had been cut. Uh, one hydraulic circuit, the port side side hydraulic circuit, completely gone. And what frightened me was the leading edge devices. I'm much, much more particular about the leading edge troops and the slats rather than losing the uh, spoilers and so on. And, uh, what did the pilots do? This was what was most impressive. They never panicked. There were five of them on board that particular day. They were very, very systematic in the way they dealt with the multitude of messages that are coming through. The team working was superb. Bullet point number two, they basically answered one of my exam questions. You had this expression and you got limited data, use justification and various assumptions to conduct various trade-offs, approximations, and come up with a ballpark figure as to what could be the result and obtain a solution. That's exactly what they did. They touched down at about 35 knots above the usual landing speed and at about 50 tons above the maximum landing weight. And every time they changed the aircraft configuration uh, they conducted simple handling quality tests to find out how the aircraft behavior had changed. They were basically flying a different aircraft to what they had been trained on. And uh, you then, of course, have emergency extension by gravity, and also you lost part of the wheel brakes, but you got some energy stored in the accumulators to give you a little bit of assistance to stop the aircraft after touching down. So, one or two other things. The Austrian power unit was running but it was not generating electricity. So that needs a bit of investigation. Lots of lessons are being learned. Uh, most frightening is that this number one engine, I have a feeling, got stuck at a constant throttle setting. Now, I discuss all sorts of failure scenarios in my lectures. <coughs> that is something I never dealt with. I look at engine rollbacks to idle power or total shutdown. But never a case, we are coming into land and that engine is stuck at a constant throttle setting. So I'm waiting to see the traces of the fan speed and the engine pressure ratio, which are indicative of the thrust being generated by the number one engine to see uh, what uh, the final report will be published in uh, May this year. Uh, then you also have um, fuel pouring out onto the very hot brakes at about 900 Celsius. Remember, this is not a service landing. This is uh, uh, rejected sort of um, high-speed landing, so an awful lot of energy had been dissipated by the, uh, by the brakes. Um, only one battery, so it was dedicated to the fire commander. Uh, all the electric's gone, so all the fans, air conditioning, everything's gone. It's midday at Singapore. You can't open the windows or the doors. It must have been like an oven inside. Full mast of the cabin crew. I very rarely give uh, credit to the cabin crew for uh, in instances such as this, but they, I thought they did an absolutely marvelous job keeping 440 people somehow calm and collected. Um, it's, uh, there must have been people of all sorts of backgrounds and they did a wonderful job. And surely the proof of the pudding is that absolutely no one was hurt in Singapore. No one. So that was a marvelous job. So. Uh, Full monster Airbus for designing an aircraft that could take so much punishment, uh, brilliant piloting and also wonderful uh, work by the fire, fire crew and uh, 
Uh, there must have been some passengers who must have helped out uh, trying to sort of calm down those who were going into panic stage and so on. And uh, the Australian Cyclone did a wonderful job publishing a lot of technical data within six weeks of the event. Rolls Royce were criticized for staying excessively quiet with the media after the event. But from past experience, they have had some not so nice experiences, and so you can't blame them for keeping very, very quiet about this. Uh, don't forget, there were a couple of Indonesians who were injured from the falling debris, but I am uh, happy to report that uh, they expected to make a full recovery. Uh, coming back to this thing about the pilots, I'm delighted to say that the Guild of Air Pilots and Air Navigators recognized the efforts of uh, the air crew and uh, presented this, uh, the five chaps in the cockpit with uh, the Hugh Gordon Bird Memorial Award, which they accepted on behalf of their cabin crew as well. So, uh, well done everybody. Going on to the next uh, designs, the future, the existing model, it's now, uh, we found out that it's room for improvement. One of the things that's being done is uh, the twist, the aircraft uh, wing is not exactly straight, there's a little bit of a twist. That twist is going to be increased by about one and a half degrees to improve the aerodynamics. Uh, it's very difficult to get things right at the model stage because by the time you do the scaling up, there are quite a few factors involving Reynolds and friction factors and all that, which uh, uh, is not easy to predict. Uh, also, quite a few weight savings. So by Christmas, say, the A380s that will be coming off the production line will be about one ton lighter. Uh, at the moment, you have a large wing on a relatively small fuselage. The reason is, you have an a, the A380-800 fuselage flying on the Dash 900 wing. It is with the Dash 900 fuselage that uh, she reached the Optimus. The best is yet to come. And uh, for that purpose, the fuselage will need to be extended. We'll have a look at that in a minute. And also there's a, a long-range version uh, which should be able to do Perth to Heathrow non-stop with a full load. Coming back to the Dash uh, 900, you have uh, the, the wing geometry and the tail section geometries will remain the same, but the fuselage will be extended with uh, additional plugs. And also, because of the increased number of passengers, it might uh, in need uh, inclusion of an additional door on the upper deck to aid uh, evacuation. Uh, and also, at the moment, the center fuel tank, this bit here, is uh, running dry. There's no fuel in it. But because the weight is going to increase, but the wing area remains the same, the uh, nominal loading is going to increase to about 5,700 newtons per square meter. Uh, absolutely no guarantees whatsoever. We think that the overall fuel consumption is going to improve by one mile per gallon on average. But when you translate that into sort of thousands of gallons, you can imagine what these savings are going to be. Ladies and gentlemen, never in the field of aerospace education was so much owed by one person to so many. There are quite a few in the audience who have helped me understand all the bits and pieces. But in addition, and this by no means the complete list, please bear with me. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Cameron, James, Nick and Jeff at uh, Bristol. They're all flight physics loads and air elastic specialists, taught me a lot. Hugh Bernard. Uh, Bernard is in charge of the Iron Bird at uh, Toulouse for the A380. <coughs> Bernard is an old boy of uh, Salford University. He's now the chief aerodynamicist for the whole of Airbus. Harry and Mark are in the uh, A380 flight test. They're local lads. They used to work at Woodford at one time. Uh, Gareth Stewart and Paul and Chris uh, taught me how to build wings for the A380. Uh, Paul, Alistair, James and John told me how to build robots that build wings for the A380. By the way, all these companies, uh, the robot builders, they are the providers of robots for Boeing as well. Um, Mark, Richard and Jim taught me about fan blades and 2900 uh, aerodynamics. Tim and Chris, uh, about three quarters of the actuation systems in the A380 are built by Moog. And uh, Tim is the head of um, Mechanical actuation systems at uh, Moog. Um, then uh, Ian, Paul, Becky talking about engine nacelles, fan cowls, thrust reversers, development of the electrical actuation systems or thrust reversers. 
Um, then uh, Guido, high Reynolds number, high altitude, flooding disease calculations. Uh, Xavier, all about failure modes effects analysis. Uh, these are all Boeing people. Mike Level has retired from Boeing now. He's now the director of public programs at uh, Museum of Science in uh, sorry, Museum of Flight at Seattle. Uh, Joe, Joe Sutter is the father of Boeing 747. My God, even at the age of, uh, I don't know, he's about 89, 90 now. He's still very, very switched on. That man is a, a genius. Uh, Panos, manufacturer of 747s. Susanna, uh, she's now the chief test pilot and director of training at Boeing. Um, by the way, she holds a record for the longest flight of a 777. She flew from uh, Hong Kong to Heathrow the long way, trans-Pacific, trans-US, trans-Atlantic, non-stop. Uh, my wife, it's amazing if when your wife happens to be the aeronautics librarian, how quickly you get access to uh, journal papers. Uh, Henry Waters, seated somewhere, one of my colleagues uh, did a second month. And it, I sometimes feel Salford University is an, almost an Airbus site. We do so much work with them. Tim, one of my, uh, uh, the head of school, and David Maring, again, one of my uh, colleagues who's been extremely helpful. Emily, she uh, won the national competition on flight simulation and was quickly snapped up by Talis to work on the A380 commercial simulators, which are used to uh, train pilots rather than develop new variants. Uh, John Faulkner and I serve in the Council of the Royal Aeronautical Society. He used to be, uh, ex, um, used to be the uh, head of flight safety at Qantas. And I'm also very, very thankful. To the, it's only when you deal with the Australians you begin to appreciate why they got a good track record for air safety. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, David uh, McGrath and uh, John Fedley and their um, team members, and also members of the PA systems, the uh, camera crew, and so on. And also each and every one of you. I never expected to uh, have to lecture to such a large audience. It's very much uh, appreciated. May God continue to bless her and all who fly in her. Thank you.